I'm going to talk a little bit and then hand over to Seb um, and then maybe pick up a little bit at the end and then we, it'll be great to have some discussions um, after the uh, presentation um, um, and input from people who are here. So yeah, I'm Nisreen Nalwan, I'm one of a professor of public health at the University of Southampton. The, our project is called MELV and that um, stands for Multidisciplinary Ecosystem to Study Life Course Determinants and Prevention of early onset bodies, bodies and multimorbidity. So like Mon said, it's really focusing about the prevention, um, particularly um, uh, you know, around that sort of burdensome early onset multimorbidity. How do we do that early prevention? And, and so really big, big task, big vision that we have. So we're just gonna take you through sort of what we did on that front so, so far. So next slide, please, Seb. Yeah, so uh, it, I think it's, it's it's helpful to start with um, this kind of um, wider, wider. Um, is is there more to click, Seb? There yeah. or yeah, uh, <laughs> it's just low. <laughs> yeah, uh, I thought we have a reduced algorithm and, and whitehead. This is called, but it's actually that is the the big one. So we've got. It's it's helpful to use the Dahlgren and whitehead, which is basically a model to describe or to show the wider determinants of health um over the life course so you know starting with that sort of uh, that we have a lot of focus on the individual biological uh, psychological social behavior risk factor all of these things but actually we always need to keep in mind those wider determinants in terms of family um family environment and the education the social network economic and obviously the wider environment um and um, and obviously the political environment as well so what determines all of those things in our society and the community that we um we live in so um so um this would apply to all sorts of health uh, health outcomes and obviously applies to multiple developing multiple long term conditions and at the bottom there you find sort of that life course approach which is basically starting from even before pregnancy so preconception uh, and pregnancy and i've done a lot of uh, my my previous work on the developmental origins of health and disease in terms of how that sort of very early period shapes health later in life and then going through infancy childhood adolescence and adulthood uh, into a old age so you can see the challenge in terms of data because they're really very um little in terms of sufficient data across the whole life course to do such analysis uh, and we are focusing on that sort of early life um, determinants um, of health. So next slide, please. Is that? Yeah. So we've got a little video uh, which was co-produced with our uh, public um, um, engagement colleagues, uh, public contributors. Uh, so hopefully it'll play now. Joe has multiple long term health conditions. A growing number of people are living with two or more long term health conditions. 3 out of 10 in the 45 to 65 age group and 2 out of 3 people aged 65 to 84. Many things throughout a person's life influence their chances of developing multiple long-term health conditions, but we still have a lot to learn about the possible causes. We also don't know much about the impact or burden involved. Everyone is affected differently, but for Joe, his multiple health conditions cause a lot of stress. Our research project aims to find out why some people develop early multiple long-term health conditions and how these conditions negatively affect their life. The best way to explore causes of health conditions is to gather information throughout the lives of a large number of people. This would obviously take many decades. There are some existing studies where this approach was taken and we can use their data but we will need other sources because they didn't follow a lot of people. We will also use information from existing databases, for example, health, education and census records. All these records are carefully anonymised using agreed procedures. Nobody can be identified. This much data is too much to analyse traditionally. Artificial intelligence using computers to learn is a great way to find patterns in data. We plan to use AI to find common features in the lives of groups of people who all have the same conditions. We hope that this research will enable us to identify particular clusters of conditions. For example, depression, diabetes and chronic kidney disease, for which we can put in place early interventions so that future generations are affected either later in life or not at all.
We can also introduce ways of targeting help to those whose conditions have the greatest impact. Try Googling our name, Meld B, to find out more. Joe has muted myself. Thank you so much um, for playing that, Seb. So um, having said that in that video that it's mainly around sort of um, analysis using AI methods, actually for this presentation, we are going to focus on uh, some of the kind of more um, causal inference epidemiological style analysis that we've done around the life course, um, um, kind of life, life course prevention of multimorbidity. Uh, but this slide just gives you kind of the breadth of Mel B so and the work packages. Um, so we would we have um, a, a big work package led by uh, the PI of the project, uh, uh, Professor Simon Fraser, around defining burden and complexity of um, um, early, um, you know, multiple long term conditions. And that work has um, produced great, fascinating results around that um, uh, work package. Two, uh, led by Professor Michael Bonovis, is about really trustworthy and responsible AI. So those uh, kind of um, um, data environments and, and kind of the, the pipelines for the data that we use and work pastry, which is mainly kind of the AI analysis around sequences and clustering led by, led by Professor Rebecca Hoyle. Um, the bit, the work that we're going to describe in the rest of the presentation is focused on work package four, which um, I lead, uh, which is around life course prevention. So it's really about identify those cl clusters of risk early in life for multi mul multiple long term conditions and identify when can we intervene for those prevention, um, you know, um, and model some prevention scenarios to prevent or delay uh, the onset of multiple long term, long -term conditions. We've got uh, work package five, um, led currently by Dr. Robin Poole, and, and basically it's about sort of the people policy and impact um, and how we translate our findings, which is obviously a, the biggest challenge in terms of um, what we do. So, and, and all of this shaped with our expert um, um, advisory group, people with lived experience. Thank you. So the data set we use, uh, we have uh, different types of data sets. So we've got the routine healthcare data sets, which is the sale data bank, which is the linked data um, healthcare and wider sort of wider determinants um, um, databases uh, that covers all Wales, uh, which is a very rich source. We've got the CPRD, which is the primary care data um, in England, but also we have got this um, unique resource. Well, this, this resource that's probably less utilized in this field in terms of um, kind of looking at multiple long-term long conditions, which is the UK birth cohort. So we've got the 1970 birth cohort data, which is of people who are born a certain time period in 1970. We've got the 1958 National Child Development Study. Again, another birth cohort, very, very rich information um, taken at multiple time points in the lifespan of people who will participate in these cohorts and really help us into, into kind of characterizing those domains of early life that we're interested in, the, the different domains, which we'll come on, come on to um, in a minute. And then the third one is a cohort in Scotland, which is the Aberdeen children of the 1950s, um, ACOF. So numbers are smaller in the birth cohorts in general. These are research birth cohorts, but the actual richness uh, of characterization of the dimensions of, um, uh, of exposure measured for individual tends to be more for those cohorts compared to very big numbers um, in, in the routine data set. So we are, um, at the, uh, and what we're going to present is mainly focused uh, um, on the birth cohort data today. So next slide, please. I think it's over it's to me you? now, Nisreen. Okay, over to Seb now. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Nisreen. Yeah, as Nisreen said, um, we are predominantly focusing on the birth cohorts, and that's kind of what we're going to present uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, and then one of the first things we kind of did in Work Package 4 as part of the Mail B project was begin to think about how can we actually kind of uh, conceptualise this early life course. Um, in particular, what, what sort of things in early life do we want to look at for um, future multimorbidity risk? Um, and so the first piece of work we did before we did kind of any analysis or even began to look into the data um, was to develop this conceptual framework. Um, and to develop this conceptual framework, um, the first thing we did was we produced a conceptual framework um, that was based on a kind of scoping uh, scoping 
policy review and also research evidence. Um, so we went through recent policy documents and, and also kind of recent uh, published uh, academic papers and identified um, 10 kind of themes or what we call domains in early life um, that people have discussed or researched um, in relation to multimorbidity later in the in the life course. Um, and we thought, well, that's quite interesting. So we know what kind of uh, the literature is saying and what the policy is saying about um, domains in early life that are important. But what we then wanted to do is we wanted to understand um, what um, domains in early life members of the public felt was important for them, for their own health. Um, and so in um, November 22 now, we held, we held um, two uh, PPI workshops um, with two slightly contrasting groups of individuals. So the first group is we, we held a workshop with um, younger uh, members of the public, and these were people between the age of 18 and 30. Um, all, uh, some had multiple long-term conditions um, and some didn't. It wasn't a condition of um, joining that workshop. And then we held a second workshop with a slightly older group of um, members of the public who were all over the age of 40. But for that group, we um, a condition of um, joining that workshop was that the um, people had to uh, report two or more uh, long term conditions. Um, and so we held these two workshops. We uh, discussed with um, all the groups um, the factors that they felt in early life um, had influenced their health or for those who hadn't developed any long term conditions, the factors they felt might um, influence their health in the future. Um, and that led us to developing um, these 10 domains here. Um, and then what we decided to do was we wanted to combine the uh, first conceptual framework. So all the, the 10 domains we identified from the um, policy review and the literature review, and also the 10 domains that we identified um, from these PPI workshops. And that, that led us to our kind of final conceptual framework that has um, kind of shaped the rest of our analysis to date. Um, and so we identified these 12 domains of early life um, early life risk of uh, future multimorbidity um, and the different colours represent um, different uh, or where where these domains came from. So where there's a kind of a two-tone colour between orange and blue that is because we found there was a crossover between a domain within the policy and um, the literature and also that domain was then discussed with our uh, within our PPI workshops. Um, however, if it's just the blue domain, that's because we found that that domain was discussed um, within the policy and the literature, but actually our PPI groups didn't really discuss that uh, area or that domain in much um, detail. And then there was one domain, this religion, spirituality and wider culture, that actually was discussed quite a lot um, with, with both of our PPI groups, but actually found kind of there was little evidence of it documented within um, the policy review or um, the literature. Um, and so, yeah, as we said, this um, has actually, uh, how we developed this conceptual framework um, has now been published in the Journal of Multimorbidity and Comorbidity. Um, and these 12 domains that are listed here have kind of influenced how we have approached the rest of our uh, research within Work Package 4. So the next stage that we did is we, oh, it's not moving on. Um, so we identified these 12 early life domains and then we said, well, now we know what people feel and what policy and what uh, literature thinks is important for um, future risk of multimorbidity. But how well can we represent those domains within the uh, birth cohort data sets that we had available? Um, so this was quite a, a labour intensive task to begin with, where we basically went through each one of our three birth cohort data sets, so ACOMP, uh, the NCDS and the BCS70. And we went through each of the um, sweeps of uh, data collection in childhood. So for, for example, here in ACOMP, um, they had a um, the main reading household and school survey and also an additional uh, family survey. And we basically looked at every variable recorded in each one of those surveys and said, well, how do these variables map onto those 12 um, conceptualized domains that we've developed. Um, and we basically assigned each variable um, to the domain that we felt they best represented. 
Um, so, uh, and then here you can see um, on the, the two on the left-hand side are the domains and um, where they map onto the data set, but also we include in these, um, these figures, the missing domains that we had within these uh, data sets. So for example, an ACONF um, with all the data we had available, we could see we could represent um, eight of our 12 uh, early life domains with the data we had in that data set. Um, for the NCDS, um, we, as we kind of expected, because the NCDS and the BCS 70 collected more data in childhood, um, both data sets had uh, four sweeps um, of data collection throughout childhood. So actually in the NCDS, we could represent more of the domains. So here we could represent um, 10 of the domains we had with the data available, um, although we couldn't represent ACEs or religion, spirituality or wider culture. And then um, in the BCS 70, it was actually the data set um, where we had most uh, the most amount of data available to us. And actually we could represent um, all 12 of our domains um, with the data we had available within those data sets. But still we, we realized that actually, although we'd done that, each one of these, this was kind of a very much a kind of high level kind of data uh, mapping exercise. And what we wanted to do was actually reduce the, um, the dimensionality and the amount of data we had within each one of these um, identified domains. Um, so what we did, so for example, here in ACOMP, we had our eight domains we could represent and we could represent with them with 74 variables. But actually what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, well, within each domain, um, where we had a group of variables, but which variable within that domain was uh, most important. So to do this, we looked at the, uh, we looked at, um, oh, gone too far. We looked at uh, the correlation between variables. Um, and then we also did um, some PCA analysis and factor analysis, where we basically um, took a domain, took all the variables within that domain, um, and then looked at, uh, did a PCA to basically identify the key components within in each one of our domains. Um, and in doing so, it meant that some of our uh, some of our variables that weren't important for that domain, we then didn't carry on, we didn't carry through to the next stage of analysis. Um, so here, for example, using this method, we went from 74, var 74 variables down to 41. Um, in, in the NCDS, we had 143 variables. And then following, um, looking at the correlation, uh, PCA and the factor analysis, that reduced our variables down to 73. And then finally in the BCS 70, um, as I said, we had far more data in the BCS 70. We had 289 variables. Um, and then following this first stage of analysis, um, our data was uh, reduced down to um, 149 variables. So again, this was just a way to kind of help produce kind of a more manageable amount of data to um, analyze in a more meaningful way. Um, and on the next slide, so this um, we thought, so this is also this whole data analysis, uh, sorry, this data mapping, um, data audit um, and PCA analysis has also been uh, published as a preprint um, and is currently out um, for review. But actually this table basically identifies for each one of our 12 domains. We just wanted to look at what the key component was. So from that PCA analysis, what component or which uh, a component was built up of a group of variables. So it could be anywhere between um, I think it was two and the maximum was five variables. Uh, well, what, what, yeah, what group of variables was most important for that overall domain? Um, and for example, here, we also are comparing um, across our three data sets. So if I just take the first component, the prenatal, antenatal, neonatal, and birth, we see that um, in ACOMP, the data we had available, the key component within that domain um, focused on uh, the physical grade. So that was um, the physical grade of the um, cohort member during birth. Whereas in the NCDS and the BCS 70, the um, component one is the most important component for that for those domains actually were more focused on maternal uh, fertility histories. Um, but you see overall, actually, there are quite a few similarities. Um, so for example, the child education and health literacy for ACOMF, it was more focused on um, average school IQ, but then in the NCDS and the BCS 70, um, it was more, more focused on educational uh, ability. But then if we look at the um, social economic uh, factors domain number eight, we see that in ACOMF and the NCDS, 
the variables were more focused or the key components were more focused on housing, whereas in the BCS 70, um, the key components were more focused on parental social class and um, finances. So we kind of we've got to this point where we developed our conceptual framework. We came up with these 12 domains. We then looked at the data we had available. We've managed to map the data we have available to these 12 domains. And in doing so, we've, we've reduced um, the dimensionality of our data um, to kind of identify the key variables or the key groups of variables within each one of our domains. Um, and so our next stage of analysis was to actually run some um, analysis looking at relationship between um, some of our early life domains and the um, risk of a combined outcome um, in our data sets. Um, for now, we're using the combined outcome of obesity and hypertension, um, and this was selected uh, for a number of reasons, but but I think as Nisreen alluded to, one of the issues we are finding with the birth cohorts is, um, in terms of outcomes, the participants are still relatively young. They're between the ages of uh, 46 to 60, depending on which data sets you're using. Um, and actually, because our sample size is only about 8,000 participants in each data set, the number of people with um, any two or more long-term conditions is actually quite small. Um, and especially if we want to kind of not just look at a count of long-term conditions, but if you want to look at two uh, individual long-term conditions, our numbers become even smaller. Um, so we took obesity and hypertension um, as a kind of as an outcome whilst we were doing some kind of uh, more exploratory analysis because we knew that was a fairly common outcome um, in both the NCDS and the BCS70. Um, and it was an outcome that was both uh, measured during uh, sweeps in adulthood. So they were measured during a nurse's visit to the cohort members um, home as opposed to some of the other outcomes which we had available, which were based on self-reported measures. Um, so the first thing we did, we wanted to uh, focus down on a couple of domains to look at. Um, and in this case, we selected five of our domains um, and we selected these five domains because we found there was a significant relationship um, between a PCA component within one of those domains and um, our obesity and hypertension outcome. Um, so that led us to focus on the prenatal, antenatal, neonatal and birth, um, which is uh, uh, focusing on both um, uh, during pregnancy and then uh, factors around the time of pregnancy, um, developmental attributes, which is around kind of um, developmental markers um, in early life, uh, child education, which is um, educational settings. Um, so it could be things like educational tests, academic abilities, um, social economic factors, um, and then the parental and family environment. So this was um, more, not so much things like parental separation, but we we're trying to understand um, the type of uh, environment the child may have grown up in. So, for example, some of the variables within that domain um, were things like how often do um, the family go on outings together or go to restaurants or go on walks. Um, the other questions were things like um, are the parents interested in the child's education? Um, so it was more kind of a wider kind of family environment the, um, the co-op member grew up in. Um, and so the first the first uh, method we we used was we took our so this is just we're just this slide is just for BCS seventy cohort so we took our uh, five domains and we basically created a risk score of adversity so we took each one of our variables we converted it into a binary variable with um, one indicating um, higher adversity and then some summed um, the variables of inside a domain to uh, create a kind of adversity risk score with the higher higher the number the um, greater adversity within that domain um, and here we're just presenting the kind of descriptive results um, looking at um, this adversity risk score between zero and two plus for each of the domains and then the percentage who then went on to um, have measured obesity and hypertension at age 46. Um, and as you'll see here, we see that um, across all, all the um, five domains we were considering, we saw that those who scored higher adversity within each one of the domains in childhood uh, were more likely to report um, obesity and hypertension. 
And so we started with this method um, and we presented some of this uh, initial results within our um, within our work package for team. But actually, we began to think, well, actually, one of the issues we have with using this method is um, in in converting everything from a uh, and converting everything into a binary score, we're losing some of the granularity um, of the data. But also, more importantly, we're then treating every single variable as the having exactly the same weight towards the outcome, where actually we know that some variables might be more important than others. So we began to consider kind of other methods that would allow us to look at domains, but to um, analyze it in a better way that kind of captured the individual weighting of each variable. Um, and that led us to um, develop this um, slightly diff different method where we basically created a predicted risk score within each one of our domains. Um, and to do this, the first thing we did is we took all those variables again in their original form, so not um, as binary variables, and we used um, a stepwise backwards elimination. So we used um, to select the variables um, for inclusion within the domains. And then the um, the uh, variables that remained after this stepwise backwards elimination, we created this predicted risk score um, for those remaining variables um, of obesity and hypertension risk for each of the cohort members. So for, for that meant that within each domain, we had a continuous predicted risk score of obesity and hypertension for each one of our cohort members. We then took that predicted risk score, we centered it on the mean, um, and it was bound between zero and one. Um, and then what we, we did is we wanted to explore A, the relationship between uh, risk scores for each domain. So we did a correlation matrix to look at the relationship um, between domain risk scores but then we looked at we then produced logistic, logistic regression where we took each one of our domain uh, specific risk scores and regressed it to the combined outcome of it's in hypertension adjusting for demographic confounders to begin with but then secondly we included all five um, predicted risk scores for each one of our domain in the same model and we did this so then we could identify, well, if we were including all five uh, predicted risk scores in the same model, which domain um, is uh, most important when we're holding the, uh, when we're comparing to the other domains for the risk of obesity and hypertension. So some of our kind of preliminary results around this. Um, this is um, the BCS70 to begin with. So this is the odds ratios um, of having a BCS in hypertension at age 46 in relation to these predicted risk values um, of a BCS in hypertension for, for our five early life domains. Um, and we, so we split the, the dotted lines are where they've split up uh, for each domain. Um, and then the, high, the first odds ratio is um, just accounting or just adjusting for demog demographic confounders. And then the second odds ratios is when we include the other domains within the same models. Um, and so I think the first thing to notice is that we see that um, for the BCS70, um, if we just look at when we accounted for confounders, um, all five domains uh, were associated to the risk of obesity and hypertension. Um, and then when we um, adjusted for the other domains within the same models, we see that actually the odds ratios odds ratios are reduced, um, but actually um, all the domains remain significantly uh, associated to the risk of obesity and hypertension, um, with the strongest association to the with the um, parental family environment um, domain and the social economic factors domain. So the two domains at the bottom. Um, and then we produce the same results for the NCDS. And we see um, overall a fairly similar pattern of results. Um, the first thing to notice is that the odds ratios are slightly higher in the NCDS than the BCS70. Um, and again, when we just adjust for confounders, we see that all the domains are were associated to obesity and, hyp and hypertension. Um, and um, although this time when we adjusted for the other domains in the same models, we actually see this um, attenuated the significant association to the um, parental and family environment domain, um, which obviously is a different result to what we found in the BCS70, where we found that the parental and family environment domain was one of the most important domains, 
um, even in the final model here, we actually see this association is uh, attenuated. Um, although, um, like with the BCS70, we also see that um, it's the potentially the social economic and factors domain um, that is the most important for obesity and hypertension risk. Um, so that was kind of modeling uh, some of our domains and looking at the risk of one um, of a combined outcome um, in midlife. And then the next stage, which I think Nizreen is going to discuss a bit more, Thank is how we, how we then...